All right, let's uh, kick it off. I also removed the waiting room, so hopefully we will, if more people join, they will uh, just uh, enter without interrupting us. So hello everybody, I'm uh, Dimitrius and welcome to this refactoring for testability in C++ uh, webinar. It's uh, organized by Edument and has received great, really tremendous support from uh, the GBG C++ uh, meetup group. Uh, members of which, for example, Johan, I know he sent it to other uh, C++ communities. Uh, I've seen many people from Stockholm. I've seen some people from München, from Germany, uh, and I don't know where he sent it, but uh, it, it did a great impact. So thank you guys from uh, GBDCPP. So before we get started, uh, I would like us to break the ice a little bit. I already have asked you to write where you're from. Most people are from Gothenburg. We have some uh, persons from other places, like I, I noticed Madrid, Germany, Stockholm, uh, Britain, uh, and so on. Um, so let's get, I would say, acquainted with uh, Zoom. So I will try to make this uh, workshop presentation as interactive as possible, because I think it's much more uh, fun. And me speaking uh, at the screen is not that fun. Uh, so let's have it as much as possible as a real, as a live uh, meetup. So let, let, let's start by this. So how well do you know Zoom? So by now you should be seeing um, a poll somewhere in your screens. If you're on the phone, it will be a new activity popping up. If you're on your computer, I think it, it, it pops somewhere. So I would like you to vote. Uh, uh, let's get acquainted. I'm going to be having many, many polls throughout this presentation. Uh, so to keep things uh, more interactive. So please feel free to vote. Uh, how, how good are you on uh, using Zoom? I'm going to give you like a few seconds. And this is how generally we'll be doing things. Mm -hmm. I see you're, most of you are very good uh, with Zoom. Great. Most of you are pros. All right, so from what uh, I see, uh, most of you are uh, pros on Zoom, which is great, good, we'll, we'll do great in this meetup. Um, so let's, uh, let's have another, another poll right there. So uh, basically, how, how are you feeling today? Just, you know, you're, maybe many of you are working from home, hopefully I am, uh, maybe are, you know, are, uh, if you're in Sweden, you may be permitted. Hopefully you still have a job, um, but um, how are you feeling today? Mm -hmm. So most of you are feeling good, which is great or good enough, uh, lagom as we, uh, as we have in Sweden, uh, which is great to know, uh, good. So my, my last question is actually uh, as a follow-up, what do you think about the time of the event? So usually when we have uh, meetups, uh, we, we typically have them after work. So they, they usually start at five or 5.30 and they go up to, uh, to like seven or eight, depending on how long it is. So this is a new thing for me. So I would, uh, I would like to, to know. Mm -hmm, interesting. So people who enter using the browser don't see the polls. Well, hopefully it's not too many of you. So uh, at least 40 of you can see the polls, which is good to know. So most people find that the time is good enough, which is great. Um, uh, good to know, good to know. Uh, we are not too much off with our uh, choosing. Um, so, that was the, the last poll for now. So let's talk a bit very quickly about me. Some of you may have seen me, some of you may not. So I, I grew up in Rhodes, which is an island in Greece. And if you are from Sweden, you may have visited it already. It's very popular among um, especially young uh, Swedes to go and you know party hard down at the bar street. 
I work as a software engineer uh, at Edument uh, in Gothenburg. I've been doing that for around uh, six months. Uh, and at the same time, and that takes about 80% of my time. The remaining 20%, I am, of course, responsible at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, later. I have, I would say, many interests. Um, but the more, let's say, scientific ones or the more one, the ones really technology are embedded systems. I really like software architecture. I'm very picky with API design and especially readable uh, and very useful and very, let's say, evolvable and scalable API design. I'm a lot in open source software and hardware, meaning that um, uh, I really like projects that are uh, they, they can be reproduced, they can be sold, they are released under open source licenses, both on the software but also on the hardware level. I really like robots, portable gadgets, especially things you can wear, IoT. Uh, I am into 3D printing. I used to have uh, one uh, right here, but um, now that I brought a big screen to start work from, work, working from home, that is uh, in the storage. And I really like autonomous driving, especially when it can has to do with small robots, uh, you know, positioning themselves in, in the space and navigating uh, autonomously around. Uh, finally, I have a website uh, which you can uh, see the link over there, uh, where I usually blog about my thoughts, but mainly new projects. So I'm gonna start with things I do off work. And um, that is, I'm, my main part-time hobby is creating small open source projects. And as I mentioned before, I'm also into open source hardware. So I really like for those projects to include both software and hardware. So starting from the upper uh, left corner, we see a thing that um, intended to be an indoor navigation system using uh, the y basically measuring Wi-Fi signals and being overall a very low power design. Then you can see a very simple and easy to use and cheap, very cheap to create the gesture uh, sensor for your uh, computer. So you can switch slides, you know, create presentations and basically make hand gestures to uh, change slides. Then you have uh, a small uh, inter Wi-Fi connected lamp that we're using uh, at my previous uh, jobs to uh, be able to code review fast. So every time there was a code review app would get a notification, which would also indicate who has started the, uh, the code review. Uh, then another gadget we're using at work, the so-called Scrumtato that uh, starts beeping and vibrating if you're talking for too long at your uh, daily standup. Further on, uh, the Android Autonomous Vehicle we stuck uh, an Android phone on top of a RC car. We use the phone's camera to navigate autonomously. The ultra, oh no, not on the phone. It's called the Sonic Disc. So the Sonic Disc is a 360 ultrasonic uh, sensor that talks over I2C uh, and can get you a 360 view of the environment in a very low price and very easy programmatically. And finally, uh, an e-paper display that's also connected to Wi-Fi and can fetch uh, bus departures. So that was on my spare time in the afternoons, in the evenings and the weekends. During the day, I'm uh, working for Edument. Uh, so Edument uh, is uh, uh, a tech company that, is, uh, that has different business areas. So one of the business areas is education. So we offer uh, education packages for mainly companies and individuals. Uh, there, there, further on, we also have uh, consulting services and we are also into getting involved with startups, especially that are in uh, an earlier stage and help them uh, grow and support with technology. Uh, further on, that was, that was my 80%. My the remaining 20% right now I'm spending on uh, Gothenburg University, where I'm teaching a course on system development, uh, where students get uh, some small cars uh, and they basically learn how to create a system following engineering best practices. This means that it's not 
not everything is about the code, it's about the requirements, it's about ensuring continuous uh, quality uh, and so on. So I'm gonna share these slides with you. Feel free to check out the links. Uh, I, I believe these are links to their uh, GitHub repositories. Everything is uh, done in the open. Uh, the new students this year are, are doing great. They are more into, uh, especially this year, they're more into continuous integration. They're more into having their car connected to the internet. So I think really great things will come uh, out of this. A bit on the agenda, we're going to start and we're going to talk about uh, Google Test and Google Mock very briefly. Then we're going to talk about what is hard to test code, what is easy to test code. So to establish some baseline for the patterns to refactor and why would we refactor those uh, software. Before we do that, guess what's coming? Another poll, just uh, to see what you guys think. So I would like to ask you, how much do you enjoy writing unit tests? So feel free to vote. I'm gonna leave it for uh, a few seconds or until everybody has or most have uh, voted. Hmm? Interesting, I can already see the results, you can't yet. And I got a question if I have tried the catch too. Uh, no, I haven't actually uh, tried it. Uh, I've heard it's easier to, uh, to install, even though I've basically copy paste my configuration, my CMA configuration um, for Google tests. So I haven't actually found the need to use it, but uh, I like that it comes in a header file basically. So most of you are somewhere in the middle uh, some of you really don't like unit tests. I hope you will, uh, I'm gonna change your mind a bit on that, or at least give you hope. <laughs> and uh, I hope to get people that are eh, so-and-so, uh, somewhere in the middle. I hope I'll get them to, to, the, to the category that likes uh, unit tests uh, a lot. So uh, let's move on to Google Test and Google Mock. Uh, so, I, I think at least, uh, I don't have actually data about this, but I think it's the de facto unit test framework for C++ or at least this means that we have used it in every single job in my uh, previous experiments. Uh, it's an X unit test framework, meaning that um, uh, you may have, uh, uh, you may have, uh, uh, it, it syntax will, will be familiar to you if you have used something like JUnit or something in Python. It can uh, run on multiple platforms, I mean, in Linux, Windows, and so on. It's open source. Uh, you can find its source code. It has pretty good documentation, I would say, and pretty good community. Um, so I haven't found actually a use case that I can't find some information about it online. I thankfully never had to go through its code, and I'm sure that would be a pain because I suspect it's mostly made up about with uh, from templates and huge macros. I find it easy to integrate with CMake and therefore your project. And I would say it has a, it's pretty basic. So it has mocks, uh, assertions, some parameterized tests uh, and so on. The, it doesn't have anything fancy. And by fancy, I'm, I mean some uh, dependency injection container, no spy. So really cool things that you can see in other frameworks, especially in other languages. Um, like Mokito in Java, you won't find these things here. So things are more basic, they're more bare bones, but I mean, in most cases, uh, that is probably good enough. So I I'm going to have uh, yet uh, another poll for, or actually two polls for you. So uh, have you used the Google test before? Perhaps uh, another question would be, were you using another framework for C++ instead of yes or no? I will keep that, I will note that down for uh, our next uh, uh, event. You know, perhaps this uh, question doesn't indicate the full truth. Cool. So uh, most of you have actually used the, uh, have actually used the 
Google test, which is great because uh, not that it really will re really matter for this um, uh, for this uh, workshop, but uh, at least uh, we you know we will be speaking a common lingo if we need to. Uh, another another question I would have to you for you: Do, Should I speak more about mocks? Are you familiar with the concept of mocking uh, in unit tests? Right. So, I mean, I already see we have some, so about one third of you want, would like me to talk a bit more about it. So I'm not gonna uh, uh, talk too much about it, but uh, so basically mocks, uh, or let's say in unit testing, you want to verify some behavior uh, and whether that behavior can be some result that you get back or in, uh, in more complex cases, uh, it may have to do with uh, behavior, so and how your your component, your unit under test, interacts with other parts of the system. So, in order, and this is all about you know you need to verify either result or behavior. So how do you verify a result? You can have some simple assertions. So you basically say, oh, when I call the function foo, it will return three or it will turn bar, whatever. However, if you have, let's say, your, you know, you have a more complex logic, your, uh, your function doesn't return anything or just returning something is not enough. It has to, uh, you need to know if it did something to another part of the system. Uh, and this other part of the system, you actually should not include in your testing environment because you actually want to test only your own thing. You don't want to test other people's code you want to, you don't want to test the operating system and so on and that's where the mocks come in and the mocks can basically emulate um, other parts of the system other software uh, and so on and you can uh, let's say de define or determine how these parts of the system also um, behave so you can have a mock return something, you can have a mock behave a spe specific way, you can have a mock invoke a certain function when it is being called and so on. That is very briefly. Um, and uh, if you want to read more about them, there is a lot of material online. I wouldn't go too much on it. So let's talk a bit about hard to test code. Um, when is code hard to test? So yet again, this is my personal more or less behavior. It's not, uh, it's not the exact uh, science, I would say. Um, I'm actually a little bit interesting. I'm trying to figure out, there's another poll coming, but I think it's later, so I'm not gonna uh, move forward. So when is code uh, hard to test? To begin with, code is hard to test, and in most cases, code is hard to test when it's very complex when it depends on previous states, when there are one million branches in between, you know, if this, then that, then if this, then loop 10 times uh, and have an if statement in there as well. So when uh, code is hard, is very complex, it's naturally very hard to test. However, we're not going to talk about such difficulties with code. This is perhaps for another uh, event. So we're not gonna talk about highly complex code. However, code can be hard to test when it's tightly coupled with other components, meaning that the behavior depends on how other parts of the system, other people's code, your own code, but perhaps in a different class. It's, it is, it's highly affecting the way that your component, your unit under test behaves, and that makes things hard. Furthermore, you may have some dependencies on global or, or static states and this can be both a logic uh, this can, can cause both problems both to the logic but also to the you know the way you compile things you may have sequential coupling which is uh, very often a big problem because you have to call things in a specific way so to end up in a specific state you need to always run some things before that in order to reach that state and that is also for me complexity makes things harder to test in our case, we're going to focus more or less on other things, uh, everything else, more or less, okay, not everything else, aside of high complexity. And of course, there are many more 
good examples and cases of hard uh, to test uh, code. But overall, if I would have to uh, summarize it, I would say that uh, code that is uh, code is hard to test when it's not fun. So when when testing is not fun for me, when you have a, to write a lot of logic, extra logic, test logic that never goes into your product, just so you can test your uh, component. When you, for example, you can create fakes containing a lot of logic. Uh, when you have to change visibility of member functions and attributes, just so you can test them. Honestly, that is very bad. You shouldn't do it. It's, uh, let's say, a very good uh, case of leaking information uh, about, um, uh, so, so test environment inf information being leaked into the production environment. Uh, and another thing that is not fun at all is when you have to test things that have been tested before. Or let's say things that shouldn't be tested within the context. It may have been tested from you before. It may have been tested by others before. It may not have been tested. The, problem, the point is that there are some things that you shouldn't test because it's not within, it's not your concern to test them within the context of uh, unit testing. Tests are not fun when they fail sporadically and even worse when executing them takes ages, meaning that when you want to get you know, this really quick feedback in order to know if you're uh, doing things correctly, it can take like many seconds or even minutes to run and sometimes fail, which is even uh, worse. So what is easy to test code? Uh, more or less uh, the opposite. Uh, it's code with low complexity, duh. So very simple code, very simple computationally code is also very easy to test. However, we have some, and we're not gonna bother with that. Uh, actually, all of our examples gonna be uh, simple in complexity, however difficult to test because of the reasons that we previously mentioned. So what is easy to test code? It's solid code and uh, please, look into that we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about the i mainly uh, no we're inversion control yes uh, we're gonna talk about uh, i primarily from solid easy to test code is code that prefers composition over inheritance and it's also related to solid easy to test code in is doesn't depend on concrete classes or components it, it depends on abstractions. It does not in, depend on, on implementations, it depends on interfaces. Furthermore, easy to test code is also functional code without side effects, which you may or may not be able to write. However, you should always strive for functional code with uh, outside effects and probably many other uh, things that I forget. So before we go, uh, up to or no actually no so we're not we're going to talk about the pattern so by pattern i mean like difficult like common difficult scenarios uh, to refactor but before we do that before we go there um i would like you to take whatever i say with a grain of salt so treat these examples as let's say generic guidelines they may or may not apply to your project. You may be using some weird uh, framework, you may have some uh, constraints on performance, some really weird ISO 26262 standard that doesn't allow virtual dispatch uh, and uh, using uh, virtual functions and whatever. Um, so take everything as like a good, probably hopefully <laughs> good uh, guidelines and keep in mind that maybe there is a chance, however big or small that may be, that these things are not applicable. So perhaps it can be easier with some more advanced test frameworks. And I mentioned the fruit there, which is also by Google. And it's, I believe it has to do with dependency, dependency injection framework. So it, it really allows you to inject things uh, even if you haven't done that uh, manually. So please do check it out i'm gonna check uh, send um, uh, send out those uh, uh, slides later on uh, before we 
go there. I would actually like, uh, I had some notes, but I can't see them yet. So I'm going to start a poll. I, I would like to hear uh, what you think. So judging, you know, to you, according to your experience, why do you think we have hard to test code? And thank you, Emily, for the the uh, the deem the solid indeed. That's what I meant. So I believe most have uh, voted, and I'm happy to say that we. Uh, I'm also sharing the opinion with most of you here. I would say that, uh, according to me, also uh, code is hard to test when it's uh, badly designed. Um, so, yeah, we are on the same page. Good to hear. Uh, so let's let's go to the to the first example. Uh, let's say, or oh, actually before that, the, the core philosophy be, 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 before things I'm gonna show you uh, has this. Uh, the, let's say if it can be summarized, it can be summarized uh, like this. So we have cases of our unit under tests as it's called, ignorantly controlling itself, meaning that it may be getting its own dependencies, uh, and those dependencies uh, are, uh, uh, getting its own dependencies causes a problem when, when in unit testing because it's hard to create assertions on them. It gets its own configuration, uh, maybe from another part of the system, God knows what. The point is that it's, it's very hard for us to inject or to, to have to, to create some assertions over it yet again, and finally managing its own uh, life cycle. And the solution to that is inversion of uh, control, this uh, object oriented programming concept where you get dependencies, dependencies ejected as well as configuration, and you have the life cycle managed from outside. So this doesn't only increase the testability of things, but uh, also the reusability. You can actually start reusing things uh, and you actually, let's say if you're making a platform, you can actually use it as is in many different cases. You don't have to have uh, many small little variants of your so-called uh, platform. So let's move on to our first uh, example and uh, let's have a look. So there are two functions uh, here, write and read. Uh, and um, let's say they, they do something pretty simple. They basically get the, the write function gets a file path as a string. In C++, we'll actually uh, start using C++20. We will hopefully start using uh, the proper uh, file types for this. Uh, so anyway, we get uh, a file path and some content to start in, store in this uh, file path. So we create an output stream, blah, blah, blah. We write it and we return the result. Uh, similarly to read, we get a file path. Uh, we read it, we put it in a local variable and we return an optional variable uh, if um, there is something to read. Otherwise, we turn an, a null pointer or a null object. Overall, I would say it's pretty straightforward. Write, return the result, and write the file, and read, give back the result. So, what do you think about this? Is this difficult to test, yes or no? Or, I mean, I, I say obviously that it is difficult. Why? I mean, uh, but I would actually, I want to hear your uh, opinions or if we are on the same page uh, here. Yeah, most people agree with me, which is great. <laughs> Uh, as I said, the, 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 these polling questions are a bit uh, for fun, just to make you uh, more lively. Uh, indeed, that would be, I would at least, I would say it would be difficult uh, to, to test because if you would have a function that uses the read function to, uh, you know, this encode function, if you would like to test this, it would be pretty difficult because we would maybe have to create an actual file then we would uh, have to write some other file and may somehow verify that this file was actually written correctly. Uh, 
the problem is that uh, we we have um, you know we would end up testing our file system or we would also end up also test our file system when there may be difficulties uh, with that uh, and uh, you would need to write extra logic just to read files just to make sure that the file was written and yada 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 so how would you refactor this um, simple we would first abstract the file reading uh, and the file writing so we i would prefer not to use the same interfaces the same interface for the, those and here is i believe where the i in solid uh, comes and it would create two interfaces one that uh, exposes the functionality to read a file and another one the functionality to to write a file and we wouldn't actually test the functionality of reading and writing uh, files uh, because that's, that, that's pretty simple code. And we have other kinds of tests for that. We have our integration tests and our feature and end-to-end -end tests for all these things. We don't need to test the two previous functions. We actually, we, we shouldn't unit test these two things. We have uh, other kinds of tests for these what our business logic is actually in this encode function we should actually test this so once you uh, abstract this um, into two separate interfaces you can inject them you can implement them you know you saw the, the implementation will say the same but you will inject them preferably through the constructor and then you will mock them out and if you have used mock before Gmock, you will know how simple it is. Uh, there is actually Google test even offers some um, some Python script to automatically generate some uh, the, the mock functions for you. So another very common scenario and difficult scenario is hard coded uh, dependencies. So yet again, I I have failed a little bit with my uh with my all oh, right i have some notes sorry uh, so why is this difficult um and i'm not gonna ask you if it's difficult or not because it it would be boring and also biased but uh, what i'm gonna ask you is how many classes if we wanted to write tests for these two classes how many cl classes would we have to test just by seeing this uh header definition let's say how many classes would we have to test for directionless odometer and how many classes would we have to test for the directional odometer that's a trickier one that's not a yes or no i'm gonna wait uh, a bit more i actually don't remember the answer i also have to all right and that one is more mm -hmm. interesting so now now actually the uh, the poll results are actually, uh, much interesting and people answer slower. They, uh, they take their time to read. By the end of the, of the slides, I'm going to share also the, the actual code examples. There is a repository that you can find these and you can check out the actual code behind them. Most of these, I would say, are inspired, or all of them are inspired by real-world examples. So I believe uh, these classes, they are pretty much uh, almost copy-pasted from uh, a library that controls a small vehicle. So half of you have answered. Uh, so some of you have the side out. I don't know if um, uh, it's uh, going to be your needing your time or not but i'm gonna stop the poll and i'm gonna share the results so i would say i would argue also because i mean i know what's behind the code that in the case of the directionless odometer you need to test in total um, uh, you would need to test uh, the following classes you would need to test directionless odometer of course and you would also need to test this class, which is a concrete class, which gets instantiated right in our uh, header definition. So you would not only test directionless odometer, but you would actually have to indirectly or directly test 
the my interrupt service manager. Similarly, in directional odometer, you have to test directional odometer, of course, but also the directionless odometer, which is a concrete class. And further on, you would also need to test my pin reader. So it's at least, I would say three, if you count this one, four, but you get the idea. So we have extended the concrete class. We are hard coding our dependencies uh, here and that basically creates more work for us. So how would we test something like that? It would get uh, pretty tricky. Um, you would, um, you have some uh, classes, you know, being called this one, M interrupt manager is, a, as we said, it's a hard coded dependency. How do we create, how do we set expectations on this? I don't know, probably would, create some kind of stubs or maybe some fakes that have some logic inside. Uh, yeah, things would get tricky. I would not find this too fun. How would we uh, make sure that the pin reader returns uh, true or false so we can test both branches of this uh, inline if statement? Yeah, All the, the, I'm sure there are ways to do this. The point is it wouldn't be fun. So yet another time, the solution would be to abstract, and this is a little bit different. So we see that they, these two classes have common functionality, and, and that is why we are, uh, how do you say, we are extending a concrete class. So instead, we should uh, abstract the common functionality. We, we have to you know, conceptually find what is that common functionality and extract it, and we call this class encoder, and then, inject everything else. So no more hard-coded uh, dependencies, we inject it. So interrupt service manager is the interface that used to be, or that is, um, or was uh, implemented by the my interrupt manager. We have this uh, encoder class, remember the common functionality that now gets injected. And similarly here, we have the common functionality injected, we don't, uh, extend anymore a concrete class and we have the other dependencies also uh, injected and eventually you have something that can be mocked out very easily further on time uh, time is actually something that looks very simple but can get like really messy and like really slow and like yeah like imagine like you basically running the same test for 1000 times and one test taking 13 seconds or even more, you know, th things just become less fun. It's not, now you don't only have to wait for things to compile, the tests compile, but you also have to wait a lot. Like, uh, and especially if things start breaking, which is very common with time, especially when it comes to threads, you know, it, it just, just gets so uh, sad and so boring and not fun how would you test uh, something like this? So we have a power controller. Here we have nicely, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, interfaces being injected to it, that's fine. But here we have uh, the turn on function, which is the main one. The idea is that it sends a pulse. It sets the pin uh, high for one second, then it sets it low. Then it waits for some other thread to come and trigger this uh, uh, atomic variable that you can find uh, blah, 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 here. Um, and it, so it will wait for up to 10 seconds uh, and then it will return if it's timed out or not. That's the whole idea. So, you know, this is very simple code, really straightforward. Send the pulse, wait for 10 seconds, wait for up to 10 seconds to receive a so-called response. Something like this would be actually pretty hard to test because for every test, you would at least have to wait for this guy to run. And then depending on your uh, logic, you would have to wait maybe up to 10 seconds to verify uh, what happens if timeout occurs, which is, yeah, it would very easily, uh, you know, throw the time or increase uh, the time or your execution time of your tests by many orders of magnitude, especially if you are repeating them uh, often. Yet again, you refactor. 
we create, let's say, a very simple class, like a wrapper for the slip functions, and we call it something like timekeeper. And we have a slip for which eventually in our concrete class will determine how we slip. And it can be a simple, uh, you know, C++ thread uh, slip, or it can be, maybe we need to go into deep sleep, I don't know. But that's the overall idea, you know, different implementations, we don't care, our, our turn on function shouldn't care how we sleep. So we, in, we will be injecting this uh, interface, and then we have this, you know, a thing called a synchronous timer, you may call it something like scheduler. The idea is that we can schedule things, we can schedule some like preferably sort tasks to uh, be triggered after a specified delay. And remember, this is not a concrete class, this is also an interface. So we go to our turn on function, we have set pin, fair enough, it's the same. And you know, remember this is also abstracted out, pin manager is uh, an interface. Slip for yet another interface, clear pin, and we, you come at this schedule. So basically you schedule, you pass a callback to, you know, depending, uh, like, like basically flip this um, uh, condition, sorry, not condition variable, flip this atomic uh, Boolean and notify the condition variable after 10 seconds. However, we don't actually, <laughs> We, we pass this to the asynchronous timer, which will be an interface. We don't actually wait. And eventually you end up with something that you can verify that um, you have passed the right uh, arguments and you have something that you can capture. So you can very easily uh, save this as an argument uh, locally on your uh, unit tests and invoke it wherever you want. So you don't actually have to wait for 10 seconds uh, or whatever. Finally, and I think this is my last example, which is good because we are soon running out of time. Um, and this is, let's say, a bonus. This is one of my, uh, one of my favorite ones. Um, so I would say, why is this difficult? And I have a poll, but I don't remember if I should give it before or after. But let's, let, let's say like this. So when, for me, this is one of the most common problems, having application logic, or sorry, having domain logic dependent on application logic. It is overall common in like typical layered architectures to have higher level components depend on lower level components and not vice versa. So the, the idea with this is that you want, you don't want generic functionality, functionality that should be reused, functionality that may be perhaps part of a platform to be dependent on different little variants that can be really many depending I get again on your uh, context. And that is because there can be some circular dependencies, hidden or not, eventually the domain layer, the platform becomes too unsustainable. You know, you have this if statement, oh, if this is an instance of, instance of that, or, or if we are in this project, do that. If we're in the other project, do the other things. Um, and especially when you start handling multiple variants of the same uh, product for different customers or different markets, it becomes unsustainable. It becomes a big blob of, especially in C++, some uh, macro, uh, if defs uh, everywhere, which I really, really, really despise personally. Uh, and it's overall, uh, as you, as I think you understand, a bad design. Uh, so how would we test this? For me, it's rather simple. If you have some functionality that's supposed to be generic, that's used across project, but needs to have some kind of knowledge of the variant or actually has knowledge of some variant. If we are building for Ericsson, if we're building for, or, you know, in our code, we have some, if this is for Ericsson, do that. If this is uh, for Volvo cars, do the other thing and, and so on. For me, it is a very strong architectural smell and the source of technical depth and all sorts of problems. Instead, you should try to figure out what this differentiating functionality is, what, where this variation point is, abstract it out and inject it. 
So in our example here, we have a very simple thing. We, and it's actually very interesting. We have a very, very generic component. We have this communication manager. It uses a serial port. And all it needs to do is like send something via serial that others can use. And inside it, we have something like this. If we are on the full product, you know, uh, send the increment the sequence number, put a colon and send a message. If, however, on the other product, because we have to talk with another ECU or uh, that uh, manufacturer is weird or whatever, we just need to send M for message, the message in there, uh, and a delimiter, a comma. Uh, for me, I don't know. I don't know. I, I actually should ask you, what, what do you guys uh, th think about this? Is this a problem? Or let's say, because, okay, maybe everybody agrees, how much of a problem something like this? So I have launched uh, uh, an easier this time poll. You don't need to think of code. All right, thank you so much. So I'm glad to see that most of you think it's a pretty big, uh, pretty significant problem. Uh, I would also be somewhere between four and five. It really depends on what other uh, problems. Uh, uh, and one guy uh, mentions that, uh, sorry, privately in the chat, that guy writes that uh, people who don't think this is um, a big problem is our previous manager. Uh, I bet he's laughing right now, uh, the guy who sent it to me. In any case, uh, I would also be between four and five, depends what other problems are in the system, but I overall consider this to be very problematic. What I would do instead is I would abstract, again, again the differentiating functionality. You know, serial formatter, you know, if we need to format things different on the serial port, depending on what project we are on, on what variant we are running, then this actually should be a different thing. To begin with, communication manager should not care what, uh, this is not the concern. This should not be the concern of the communication manager, which may be doing other stuff. It should be another component. And depending on the project, we will be injecting it as we do with the serial port client, for example. And we will be eventually having our bar serial form formatter for the bar product and we will be having our full serial form formatter for the full product. And maybe in the main function somewhere or somewhere where we instantiate communication manager, depending on the project, we would, we would include this or the other. Uh, and the cool part with this is like, in this case, it's, it's pretty bad. I would say because you need to, it's if def, I'm, I'm sure there are ways to do it simpler. So here you would have to actually set some compilation flag or something weird like that. There are probably ways to do it simpler, but it be, it remains a smell. Uh, and yeah, overall, it would eventually look something like this. You would inject the serial formatter and you would just send the result of the formatter. And this part you can very easily mock out. And more importantly, more importantly, you can test separately. You can have a full or a bar serial formatter test suite that just tests the bar product. You can have another test testing the full product and you can have the communication manager test testing the common, the platform functionality only and not the specific uh, products. So those were the patterns I wanted to share with you within the context uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, this small uh, webinar. We will actually be doing another workshop, a longer one this time, uh, where we'll, we'll be taking a deeper look into these patterns. We're gonna talk more about patterns. We're gonna be talking about singleton as well, <laughs> the dreaded singleton pattern. We're gonna be mentioning about the uh, mocking syscalls as well that somebody mentioned. Uh, we're going to be focusing also on, also on the unit tests of them. So in this uh, workshop or in this webinar, I mentioned that, yeah, if you inject them, you're going to yeah just test them. In the workshop, we're also going to show how they're tested and we're going to have some hands-on exercises. It's going to be for two hours. It's going to cost uh, probably around uh, 400 crowns per person. So feel free to join. We're going to send you some information about it uh, after this event. I, I think we haven't finalized uh, uh, at the time, but it's probably going to be around this time, maybe after work, maybe 
within late work hours, we're gonna see how that will uh, go. To summarize, um, some takeaways. I think that, and probably not only me, I hope you too, unit tests should be atomic and run fast. You should be verifying your code and your code only. Not other people's code, not open source, uh, not the system, not the file system, and actually not even other classes that you may have been writing. Just unit test, your unit and your unit only. Eventually, it should be fun. It shouldn't require too much upfront effort. Uh, it shouldn't require you to write some testing logic. It shouldn't require you to come up with some functionality to kind of emulate what's happening in real life, but it's not really the same. So eventually you have a smell right there. You're not really testing what's actually gonna happen. You're testing your test or something silly like that. You should uh, be writing solid code. You should be overall following object-oriented programming best practices. And I would say that uh, I'm very happy to say that the C++ core guidelines are pretty much on point in regards, you know, with, with all this. I don't think their, their goal is to create testable code. However, there are so many guidelines that if you follow them, you end up injecting things, you end up using interfaces, you avoid uh, extending uh, or being creating class hierarchies with, uh, that include uh, non-concrete classes, non-pure abstract uh, classes, and so on. So I would say that if you follow all these guidelines, you end up writing object-oriented, uh, sorry, testable, uh, very easily and fun testable code. Um, that was my last slide. Uh, you can find, I almost forgot, you can find uh, the examples uh, in this uh, repo here. Remember, I'm gonna uh, show you the, I'm gonna share this uh, slide with you so you can find the working code examples behind this. And you can always contact me at dimitris at platis.solutions. Um, I wonder if there are any questions uh, that we can take um, you can probably write them in chat. So I've noticed if, if people are uh, many, uh, it's usually more difficult to uh, take the mic and uh, many people's mics don't work. So I, I would prefer we don't open the mics, but do you guys have any questions? I will be happy to ask them or discuss them. I'm also gonna roll back to see if uh, there are any questions that I've missed. Um, I see virtual dispatch. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. It allows virtual dispatch. I didn't imply it didn't. <laughs> um, uh, how about templating? Uh, yeah, uh, templating on the product is I think, and I guess you would provide, uh, but, but uh, so this question is, uh, so there's a question. How about templating on the product in the last example? So I would always prefer to inject it uh, straight on. Um, I would like to, if you can, if you have time to write, Bjorn, um, how would you, so I haven't thought it through, to be honest, but I would say, how would you set expectations? So if you would uh, create a template and you would, uh, use a mock foo for the product, how would you set expectations on it? Or would you set mock foo on the product and pass it as an argument? Maybe you want to uh, elaborate on that if you can. In the meanwhile, Oliver asks the question, what, what if your research constraint that you cannot accept the cost of uh, V tables and V pointers. <laughs> well, that sucks, but this is <laughs> this uh, comes with the, the thing I mentioned earlier. That take this with a grain of salt. Uh, there are I I I am definitely sure there can be cases where you these things do not apply. You know, doing all these, uh, you know, creating this extra layer because by of indirection, which is the case of inversion of control creating an interface in between and using that. If you cannot do that, then you cannot, these, these, um, these how do you call them? 
these uh, examples don't really apply and instead you should try and strive to write as much as functional and uh, code without side effects so everything else still applies of the good testing best practices uh, but yeah i wouldn't like to test such really low level systems uh, that have uh, such resource constraints uh, to be honest with you So Olof asks, um, I'm interested in the expected differences on build time for different approaches. Uh, I do believe that um, build time using, um, uh, so I, I think that, you know, using the thing that you actually want, it probably compiles the fastest. Uh, then I would assume that, uh, you know, using virtual functions is the second uh, thing that's uh, fastest uh, and templating is the least or is the slowest in, compil in compiling at least we're talking about compilation but i don't have any data on this i can probably look it up but that would be my my how do you say i would basically just uh, guess that if i had to All right, if that was it, then I would really like to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to share these uh, slides with you. Uh, you're probably going to get a, a you know, we're probably going to send you a follow up email anyway, but uh, I'm going to be posting this on the GBG CPP group if you're a member of that group, but we're going to send you an email with uh, these things. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Uh, I hope we will maybe have this um, uh, workshop live, maybe after summer uh, at this point, unfortunately. But I really hope we can have arrange something with uh, GBG CPP or FOSS GBG meetups uh, that you can, uh, we can actually maybe do some exercises, we can have some longer example. We'll see until then. Um, see you, stay safe.